So welcome to the, uh, this very special lecture series. Uh, I think you're all going to be um, thrilled with it, and my hope is that you'll all be inspired by it. I think there are some really terrific people presenting who have had some amazing experiences. And um, you know, I've been struck by that, and that's one of the incentives that got me started in thinking about maybe putting together a lecture series where we could showcase the wonderful things that uh, people in the Western Montana community are doing uh, for health around the world. So we really have two things going on here. We have a lecture series on the one hand, which is open to the public, and it's, it's nice to see so many people from the public here today. And we have a class, a one-credit class, uh, that is, uh, runs parallel to the lecture series. And so one of the, my jobs tonight is to um, do some logistics with regard to the class. So for those of you who are not in the class, um, please uh, forgive me for taking some of your time to go through some of these logistics. I think they're fairly simple and they won't take a lot of time. Um, but that should be the only time when I have to do this during the course of the uh, 12 weeks or 13 weeks that we're going to be uh, having these lectures. So um, let me start there, and then after I uh, have finished with uh, the logistics of the course, I'm going to make a few remarks, nothing terribly profound, I don't think, um, about uh, global public health uh, as kind of an introduction and background to these amazing lectures that you're going to hear. Um, so uh, let me start with the note cards. Uh, those of you who are taking the class uh, for pass, no pass, or what they call credit, no credit these days, um, you should have a note card. And I would like you to just put down some very simple information there, your name, uh, your year in class, your major, uh, and any minors that you might be pursuing, uh, hopefully including the minor in global public health, but that's not a requirement for this class. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to know about any health experience that you've had. Now, I don't mean by that any illnesses you've had, but more like uh, working experience or volunteer experience or things like that. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to know is um, if you've done any, um, anything beyond travel in an uh, overseas capacity, study, um, work, research, something like that, and if so, where? And then last, I'd like to know where are you from? Where do you, what do you consider your place of origin? Okay, and if you would... We've got several people that can collect these cards. If you'd pass those in, that would be great uh, when you're done. Um, and then I want to just quickly go through the syllabus with you. Um, and then if you have any questions about that, now's the time to ask. Uh, well, but before I do that, let me, um, let me give some, uh, some thanks uh, to people who have helped put this together, especially Jamie Lockman, who is uh, the series coordinator and has done lots of uh, legwork on trying to put this together and especially follow up with the lecturers who are sometimes a little difficult to get in touch with. And <coughs> uh, but she's done a wonderful job of doing that and done it very diplomatically at the same time. And Delilah uh, Wilson, who is the program coordinator for the minor in global public health, and she's done a great job putting together materials for this lecture series and, uh, and in general, keeping the global public health program afloat. Um, Sam, 
what, what's Sam's last name? Do I don't remember. It's Halstead or something like that. Forstead. Is Sam here? Uh, and Sam um, did a nice job putting together the poster for us. And he um, he said, you know, is there anything I can do to help out? And I said, yes, we we could use a poster. And he uh, put some good work into that as well. So those are the special thanks that I want to offer. Um, so as far as the syllabus is concerned, um, you can only take the class for pass, no pass. Um, my thinking is that you should attend all of the lectures, but I'm willing to um, turn the other way if you miss up to two, but no more than two. So if you want to get a pass for the class, you should be here for all of the lectures with the possible exception of two. And that's why we're keeping attendance to check on that. Um, and then the other thing that you need to do, it's uh, not that um, challenging, I don't think, uh, is you have to write uh, a couple of papers. Uh, and I've tried to give you very specific details on what's, what we're looking for in terms of those papers. Uh, but I think what you need to know is that the papers are going to be graded for pass or not pass. Um, and they're going to be graded by two people, by me as the course instructor and by the person who gave the lecture that you're reporting on. And so I'd like you to submit those electronically so that I can email them to the other, uh, to the lecturer, get the lecturer's uh, results back, and um, record those in my grade book. So two of those have to be reported on. And uh, that's, like I said, should not be overly challenging. Um, if you want to write on more than two, just because you'd like to get maybe a little feedback or let the lecturer know what you thought of what he or she was saying, that's fine. But just make a note on that, that this is uh, over and above. So I don't have to worry about giving you a grade on anything beyond two. Um, so any questions on that you can see from the syllabus? Where are the syllabuses? Uh, we're out. Well, sometimes wonderful things happen that um, you don't expect, but they cause a little bit of problem. And that is we have more students here than we expected, even though I produced an extra five copies of the syllabus. So uh, that's fine. If you did not get the syllabus, just Give Jamie your email address at the end of class, and I'll make sure you have that before next week. Um, so let me just introduce the, uh, the, the lectures that are coming up. Uh, they're going to be a lot more uh, stimulating than what I have to say today. So don't judge the book by its cover, I guess you could say. Um, and some of those lectures are here today. And uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. So next week, Tom Bolger is going to be um, talking about, uh, uh, he's going to give us the overview, the global health, the big issues. And Tom's an ER doc here in town. Uh, he's worked in Kenya before. And so I think he's going to have some uh, really interesting insights uh, to share with us. Uh, following that, uh, Dr. Andrew Puckett. Uh, who's an orthopedic surgeon with the Missoula Bone and Joint Surgery Center, um, is going to talk about the Missoula Medical Aid work that they do in Honduras um, and what he does in particular. Um, we've got a holiday in there on the 17th of February. And then when we come back, Nancy Fitch, the former uh, 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 Curry Health Center director here at the University of Montana, is going to talk about global HIV AIDS. Nancy is in Mozambique, I believe, as we speak. And she has uh, been working for the last six years, mostly in Africa, but also in Central Asia, on HIV AIDS and on setting up clinics. Um, after that, we have uh, an expert on infectious disease. Uh, he's uh, going to be talking about MERS, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, he's also been part of the WHO team that uh, tracked down the origins of the SARS virus in Hong Kong. Um, I've heard him speak before. Heinz Feldman is his name. He works at the Rocky Mountain Lab. And that's going to be an interesting talk. His, his talk is uh, the emergence of MERS evoking SARS at its 10th anniversary. Um, and then we have uh, Dr. Brian Sippy. 
uh, who's uh, going to be talking about the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital. And Dr. Sippy is a um, ortho, uh, he's a specialist on retina. He does uh, training of uh, retina um, uh, surgeons, and he's worked in Syria and in China. So that's going to be a very interesting talk as well. Um, let's see if who's coming up after Brian Sippy is. Oh, Genevieve Reed. I, I don't know Genevieve. Um, she uh, is working in eastern Montana. Uh, so originally I was thinking of calling this the lecture series uh, uh, Western Montanans, uh, but then I had to back off on that because Genevieve really wanted to be part of this. And uh, I think she's got some very interesting things to say about maternal, um, maternal health and infant mortality in low-income countries. And she's worked in a number of places. Well, I haven't met yet met her, so I'm, I'm really, most of these other lectures, by the way, I've heard at one point in time because they've come and talked in my class, but I haven't heard Genevieve yet. Um, John Miller is going to follow that. John is with the Family Residency Program here in Family Medicine Residency Program here at the University of Montana. And he's going to talk about that very important issue of improving road safety uh, in developing countries. Um, that'll be followed by Michelle Sayre. Uh, Michelle is a nurse who uh, is part of the faculty at Montana State University in the nursing program, but she teaches on this campus. And she's also the executive director and the founder of Nurses to Nurses International. She's worked in Haiti, and she's written a book about her experiences in Haiti. And her topic is, um, deals with childhood mortality, aid, and equity. Um, uh, after Michelle, there's a, um, uh, somebody who got into the program by false pretenses. Um, and uh, who uh, has really crashed the party, and that's me, uh, because I, I really don't have any particular uh, expertise in having worked anywhere overseas in the health area, uh, but I've done a lot of research on that topic, so I'm going to talk about some of my research on transnational competence and how that uh, relates to migrant health, which is the issue that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and that will be followed by um, a very interesting program uh, led by Nerissa Kern, also part of the uh, um, family residency, family medicine residency program here. Um, she's going to talk about how international experiences as students led to interest in uh, primary health care um, and family medicine. And uh, she's going to bring with her several of the residents, the first year residents who are here, uh, so that they can talk from firsthand experience about that. Um, following her talk, we're going to hear from Tom Schwann. Tom is, also works at the uh, Rocky Mountain Lab. Um, Tom is a specialist on uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. And uh, some of you uh, as students know that Tom is co-teaching the class on vector-borne and um, infectious diseases uh, with uh, Professor Bill Granith. That's a requirement for the Global Public Health Minor. Um, Tom's going to talk about his work on tick-borne relapsing fever. It's a very interesting um, lecture because he studied that both here in Montana uh, on Wild Horse Island in Flat, on Flathead Lake and also in Mali. And so he's going to bring those two uh, experiences uh, to your attention. Um, and then the, um, the final uh, lecture on uh, May 5th is going to be by Joe Knapp, uh, who works at the International Heart Institute of Montana. Um, and what Joe has done for the last three or four years now is he's gone to Ethiopia and he's operated on uh, children who have genetic heart uh, congenital problems. And he's been able to help them in ways that aren't available yet in Ethiopia and also do some training at the same time. Um, so that's the, um, that's the program. Now you'll know, notice if you're a student and you've got a copy of the syllabus that we've asked each of these lecturers to give us a short paragraph about what they're going to be talking about so you have some idea in advance. And we've also asked them, is there anything in the way of a reading 
or some kind of material that would help students kind of get ready ahead of time uh, for your lecture. So many of them, but not all, uh, have made a suggestion or two. Uh, so I just want to reiterate what I say in the syllabus that these are recommended readings. You don't have to read those for this class. You're not going to be tested on them in this class. Um, but if you're interested, you've got something to go to. And if you want to be even more informed by the time you come to this lecture, uh, read it ahead of time. So there's some good stuff there. And um, these are what the uh, experts uh, recommend for you. Um, there is another recommended reading, and that's the Tracy Kidder book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, which was part of the inspiration for this lecture series. And many of you know Tracy was here uh, in the fall, and we had the opportunity to hear him speak. Uh, it's a you know, really wonderful book. It kind of uh, touches on a number of the issues that we're going to be addressing and that I address in my class that's being taught at the same time this semester. So if you haven't read Tracy Kidder's book, um, I really hope that you will finish it before the end of the semester. I think that basically covers the logistics of the course as far as I can recall. Is there, are there any questions? OK, I hope this is clear. But um, you know, if uh, anything comes up at any point in time over the course of the semester, you're welcome to come ask me or ask Jamie. Uh, and we'll help you out as best we can. Did you pick up all of these yet? Yeah. OK, so the second part of what I wanted to do today was uh, to kind of set this background. And so um, let me begin. Um, well, political scientists today maintain that we live in a world of permeable political borders. These borders haven't yet disappeared, but they are permeable. And uh, Donald Kendall, I think, captures this very well when he says boundary-based solutions, anything that's a boundary-based solution is out of sync with what we need for the 21st century. So we need to be thinking in transboundary ways. Um, and that means, in the case of uh, geopolitical considerations, it means we need to be thinking in a transnational way. So if we're going to function as informed and active citizens in a world that has health challenges that are both transnational, national, and local in nature, um, it seems to me that it's vital that all of us in this room develop sensitivity and awareness regarding public health issues that are of global concern. And it's important for our personal well-being as well as for societal well-being that we do this. So what do we mean when we talk about global health? I, I think there's really three things going on when we talk about global health. Uh, the first is trying to improve health for all people worldwide. That means poor people, but it also means people that are well off. We're not going to just limit ourselves to people who are uh, poor and, uh, and maybe particularly deserving. So improvement of health for all people. The second thing is that we want to try to reduce disparities in health. Uh, you know, lot, sometimes people would say, or maybe you would prefer to eliminate disparities in health. But it's probably unlikely that we're ever going to eliminate all disparities. So the more modest objective, but still a very powerful one in terms of people's lives that we have, is trying to reduce these inequities. And I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges of global health today. And in fact, what's happening, particularly in this country, but not just in this country, in a lot of other places, including countries in the global south, is these inequities, particularly economic inequities, are actually widening. They're growing. The gap between the rich and the poor is uh, expanding. 
And the third part of uh, global health, and that's, this is the one that sometimes uh, people lock onto right away and they don't think about the other two, and so I put it third for that reason, um, is to protect against threats that traverse uh, national borders, that traverse political jurisdictions. So that would include things like SARS and MERS that we talked about earlier. Uh, so that's certainly a, a, a third part of what global health is all about. And I think there are three broad classifications or categories that help us understand global health challenges. And the first is communicable or infectious disease. And this is the one that I just talked about in terms of number three. Uh, this is the one that um, is most commonly on our agenda and, and, our, uh, and our way of thinking. So that includes things like malaria, uh, TB, uh, HIV AIDS, SARS, MERS, uh, diarrheal diseases. Um, and I think it's fair to say that infectious or communicable diseases are the principal subject of Mountains Beyond Mountains, the Kidder book, and of Paul Farmer's life and, and work and uh, his um, major initiatives. And infectious disease will be one of the topics that we're certainly going to be covering in this lecture series. And then there's a second category, and that category is chronic or non-communicable diseases. And sometimes we refer in shorthand way to these as lifestyle uh, diseases. And I've, I don't know if the uh, um, public health gurus would agree with me here, but I, I see that there are uh, four main types of chronic or communicable diseases. They're cardiovascular, cancer, and chronic respiratory diseases and diabetes. These are, the, these are what I see as the four main types. And there are some common causes of these types of uh, chronic diseases. And the common causes include tobacco use, alcohol abuse, poor diets, particularly the high consumption of sugar, salt, and saturated and trans fats, physical inactivity, pollution, and poverty. So those are the chronic or non-communicable diseases, and those also will be covered by some of the lectures in this series. And there's a third category that, that is generally referred to as injuries or accidents. Um, and this would include anything related to war or violence, and we know today that approximately 80% of the casualties of violent conflicts are civilian uh, casualties nowadays. And also things like road accidents, which is an important subject that, that really doesn't get the attention that it should. I was telling students in my class earlier today about my experience in Nigeria. This is not an exaggeration. Uh, when I taught in Nigeria for a couple of years, it seemed like virtually every week I would lose one of my colleagues to a road accident, um, including people in my own department. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, we really need to give some attention to, and that there's at least two lectures in this series that are going to talk about injuries. Now what the consequences for the Global South are today is what I would call the triple whammy because on the one hand, the highest burden of infectious diseases, diarrheal diseases for example, occurs in the Global South. We've known that uh, for a long time. Uh, but what is increasingly under, we increasingly realize is that the Global South also has the highest burden of chronic diseases. Approximately 80% of all chronic diseases now occur in low and, 
middle-income countries. And by the way, that's sort of what we call how we capture the word global south. It's the low-income uh, low and the middle-income countries. They're not all geographically actually right in the south, uh, but we kind of stretch that a little bit because many of them are. Um, and uh, one of the things that's happening is as people live longer, in especially middle-income countries, they're more susceptible to the same kinds of chronic problems that we face in the relatively affluent countries. And also, the highest rates of deaths and injuries from automobile accidents and from violent conflict tend to occur in the Global South. So that's why I refer to this as the triple whammy. Um, now, there's one other thing that definitely has to do with, uh, uh, with chronic illness, and that is pollution and respiratory illness. Now, there's no specific lecture on this topic, so I wanted to throw this slide in today. Uh, and that is, and this is not the worst slide. I could find even worse uh, pictures uh, of, of the kind of pollution that occurs in China. But this is Tiananmen Square on a typical day. Um, and uh, I think the latest number was something like 10 out of the 14 most polluted cities in the world are located on the China mainland. Um, and I've lived there and lived through this, and I can tell you it's no fun. Uh, but one of the things that I, I do know is it's wonderful to come back to Montana again after you've lived in China for a while. And, and while I was there, I kept dreaming about the pristine air that we have. But, you know, maybe you've read recently that China's pollution is now starting to spread as far as the West Coast. Uh, so it might not be too much longer before we have to live with some of that here as well. Um, so in many cases, poverty is the leading risk factor or the leading determinant for infectious and chronic diseases. And there's a vicious cycle at work here because poverty increases the risk of contracting infectious disease. For example, you might not have uh, clean water. You probably don't have adequate sanitation. Uh, you're more likely, if you're uh, poor and if you're a racial minority, to be uh, 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 infected by environmental contaminants because of the place where you live. Um, and it also increases the risks of cardiovascular diseases, of cancer, of respiratory diseases, and diabetes. Um, but the cycle is such that it goes the other way, too, because poverty diminishes your opportunities to access uh, preventive and curative treatments. And then, on top of all of this, the rest of the cycle, the vicious cycle, is that poor health leads people into, or either, either leads them into, or traps them in poverty. And this is something that um, we hear a lot of anecdotal stories about how, you know, I was very successful, uh, then I got sick, I didn't have insurance, or my insurance wouldn't pay for it because I had a pre-existing condition, and the next thing I knew I had to sell my house, I had to sell my car, and the next thing I knew I was on the street. Uh, so is, there is that other side of this vicious cycle that we need to remember as well. Now, compounding all of this in the global south is the phenomenon which we call the fatal flow of expertise. And one of the things that's going on here uh, is that there's a high rate of immigration on the part of uh, professionals, not just doctors now, but nurses, um, and other public health specialists uh, from um, poor countries to rich countries where their pay is many times higher than the pay that they would get if they stayed in the global south. And so this results in a scarcity of trained health workers in low-income places. And I just gave you a couple of uh, numbers on that, but we could give you, I could give you many more in terms of uh, this example of Malawi and uh, also the total shortage. Um, now, all of that shortage is not attributable to out-migration, of course. Um, but out-migration exacerbates 
uh, this shortage that exists of, um, of trained health professionals. So just kind of as a prelude to my talk, I want to say a few things about migrant health. Um, and because I personally think this is a subject that we don't pay enough attention to. Well, basically, you know, people on the move, and people on the move, people migrate for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they move to try to be more, to get to a more economically advantageous place. But a lot of times people move because not of any choice of their own, not of their own volition, but because of the situation, the circumstances that they find themselves in. Either they live in a war zone where two factions are fighting back and forth and maybe they're burning all their crops, uh, or they might be subject to persecution uh, or the fear of persecution. And that's, that's one of the things that makes you eligible for uh, refugee status. But in any event, when people move, when people are on the move, they are particularly vulnerable. And they're vulnerable in two ways. One, because they can introduce a new disease in an area where it might have previously uh, been eradicated. And secondly, because they're, they're more susceptible in many cases to contracting either an infectious disease in the area that they uh, settle in or over time um, coming down with some of those same chronic problems that we have in countries like ours. Uh, so one of the things that we know is that many times migrants come here and they are healthier than the population of this country are when they arrive. Ten years later, they're just as bad off as the rest of us are. Um, so that's another issue. And that brings me to this concept of structural violence. And this is a concept that Paul Farmer has advanced and uh, has dedicated his life to trying to er eradicate. Um, so the concept of structural violence is basically the, the and his, his idea is that we need to struggle against um, these forces um, that uh, create violence in people's lives and uh, prevent them from getting the kind of health care that they need. And this is the main theme of, of Kidder's book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, and the principal thrust of Paul Farmer's work. Um, and, and it's the, these, the dimensions of structural violence, uh, which is basically racism, sexism, and political violence, and poverty with an emphasis, I think, on poverty. Um, the evidence for this is there in terms of the asymmetrical health statistics, risks and opportunities that exist for people in the global south, particularly poor people in the global south, compared to others. So I have time today for just two illustrations. The number of doctors per capita um, is one of these um, statistics that is extremely asymmetrical. So one number that I picked, but I could find other numbers that are just as uh, extreme, um, is that there are 80 times as many doctors per capita in the United States as there are in Ethiopia. 80 times. And another statistic has to do with life expectancy. Now, life expectancy is a, you know, I think you'd all agree, is a pretty important issue, right? right? We all want to live as long as we possibly can. And we want to live not just as, uh, in a, you know, in a way that we can't actually contribute, but we want to live an active and, um, and uh, enjoyable lifestyle. Well. If you, this, a lot of this life expectancy thing has to do with where you were born. So think about this for a minute. If you were born in Africa, your life expectancy would be 28 years less than it would be if you were born in a European country. So, you know, looking around the room, I would say most of us in this room were born probably here in the United States and we should thank our lucky stars. Uh, for the fact that uh, an accident of our birth put us here rather than somewhere else where we would be um, <coughs> able to live a fruitful life for 28 years less. So if we're going to break these expanding bonds of inequity, 
then there's got to be some really major changes. There have to be fundamental transformations. And these, these transformations have to occur in resources, in the distribution of resources, and they have to occur um, in the political realm, in terms of policy, and, and they have to occur in terms of practice, the way in which we practice um, health. So these are all, you know, really challenging. They're not easy, these kinds of fundamental transformations that are necessary to deal with racism, sexism, um, grinding poverty, those things that bring about structural violence. Uh, and it's high, and whenever you get in, into this kind of thing, it's highly contested. Um, there are people on both sides, and so then there are arguments on both sides. Uh, so it's, it's not so clear cut, it's messy. Um, it's messy and it's, and it's challenging. But I think the, one of the great things about Paul Farmer is that he has shown us through his life that huge changes are indeed possible, along with these small repairs. So you can have small repairs, but you don't have to forget about the huge changes at the same time. And so I think that's you know, what I would like to see as the message of this whole lecture series, that we're not going to just look at f huge transformations that are obviously going to take a while to achieve, but we're going to look at small measures that can make a small individual contribution along the way as well. And vice versa, we're not going to just look at the individual changes and what these wonderful people have done that are going to be giving these lectures, but we're also going to put that in this broader context of how can we um, make some uh, movement towards addressing structural violence. Um, so back to Paul Farmer for a minute. Uh, you know, I think that one of the things about Paul Farmer that is captured so beautifully in Tracy Kidder's book is that he never forgot his clinical practice. Um, he was out there traversing the world, trying to fight for, uh, fight against uh, 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 multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, fighting against uh, HIV AIDS, trying to make some fundamental changes in the way in which the health system of Haiti was organized. But at the same time, he was always meeting his patients. Um, and that was really important to him. And he, uh, went out of his way when he was traveling to make sure he kept up with the, uh, the patients that he was dealing with. Um, you know, that's got to be tiring, uh, he, and, but he did it. He did both of those two things at the same time. So I think that's kind of the model that we want to keep in mind. Um, whether it be, and also I forgot about Russian prisons as well that he was involved with. So I just had this slide that I wanted to put in here about some of the small gains that we can make. And, you know, this is uh, malaria control agents in Zambia distributing uh, insecticide uh, um, uh, uh, formed uh, bed nets. Um, and that's an extremely important small contribution that can be made in the public health area. So let's. Um, Whoops, I skipped one. Um, let's bring this closer to home. Um, I think we are important players as well. We don't have to be Paul Farmer. Um, if the world is to succeed in eroding inequities in the distribution of resources and inequities in the distribution of opportunities, it will be partly because of the actions of Montanans, both at the university and beyond. And it turns out that Montanans are indeed active in promoting health in the Global South. Um, and the work of these dedicated Montanans, I think, is largely unheralded. And their stories are largely unknown. So this lecture series is devoted primarily to um, bringing these contributions, the contributions of Montanans from the community now, uh, primarily, um, out of the shadows and to showcasing their inspirational accomplishments. You know, it's an amazing group and there are many others whom we could not squeeze into this one semester lecture series. Uh, at least half a dozen others. Um, so to me, 
Mountains Beyond Mountains conjures up alternative meetings. Uh, the first vision is consistent with that infinitely repeatable children's song, The Bear Went Over the Mountain. Now, the lyrics of this song vary depending on who you learned it from, but the way I learned it was, the bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain, and what do you think he saw? He saw another mountain, he saw another mountain, he saw another mountain, what do you think he did? He climbed the other mountain, he climbed the other mountain, and so forth and so on. So we go on like that. Uh, so that's one possible characterization of farmer's life uh, that maybe Kidder had in mind when he, when he landed on that title for his book. That of the bear who forever sees another mountain and climbs that other mountain. You know, he went from Haiti to Peru to Russia and now he's in um, um, Rwanda and Burundi and so forth. Um, but there's a possible another alternative meaning that um, Kidder had in mind when he came upon that title, which we've uh, stolen from him for the uh, lecture series, and that is that there's a mountain of a person, a mountain of a person who crosses a very steep but permeable boundary in the interest of promoting global health. And that's the, I'll let you draw your own conclusions um, um, as to what the, uh, the correct interpretation of Kidder's title is when you listen and reflect on the experiences of these many Paul Farmers in the weeks ahead. Um, but, you know, I kind of lean, t I'll tell you right now, I kind of lean towards the second alternative based upon the people that we've been able to uh, mobilize for this lecture series. So that includes, you know, Tom Bolger who's worked in Kenya, Nancy Fitch who's worked for six years assisting small clinics and supporting the distribution of antiretrovirals um, to kids with AIDS in Rwanda and Mozambique. Uh, Tom Schwann, who's done that amazing work on tick-borne relapsing fever, and only recently has that been cut short by the political uh, disturbance that's going on in Mali. Uh, it includes Brian Sippy, a Missoula ophthalmologist who's trained nationals in retinal surgery in China and uh, Syria for the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital. Uh, it includes Joe Knapp, um, who has made a, uh, four trips, I have in my notes here, to Ethiopia where he repairs children's congenital heart defects. Andrew Puckett, who works with Missoula Medical Aid and many others who do some amazing work with Missoula Medical Aid, they make, I think, three trips a year to Honduras. Um, and Michelle Sayre, who I talked about earlier, the founder and executive director of Nurses to Nurses International, who worked in Haiti right after the earthquake. Um, oops, I should have put that one up earlier. Um, so while you're being inspired by these folks, um, please consider another special opportunity that's available to students at the University of Montana, and that's the minor in global public health and its related Peace Corps prep specialization in health. Um, Global Public Health is an interdisciplinary international program with appeal to undergraduates with many diverse majors. Uh, we have majors from human biology to anthropology, uh, health and human performance and their community health emphasis uh, to political science, just to name a few. Uh, we're in our second full year now. We have 50 minors. Um, and the program, <coughs> I think, is quite manageable. You need to take 21 interdisciplinary credits. Um, you have a cafeteria of choices uh, for your core and content. And I encourage you to check, check this out on that trifold that we distributed earlier or on the website for the Global Public Health Program. And if you're at all interested, uh, please come by and meet with me during my office hours um, in LA 348. Uh, when we meet, I'll also give you details about the Peace Corps Prep Certificate in Health. Uh, we're the only university uh, that offers this specialization certificate. And I'd also like to mention that uh, the students from the Global Public Health Program and the IDS, the International Development Studies minors, have joined together to create a really dynamic student association. They call themselves the Restore the World Coalition. Um, and the current president of that 
Coalition is here with us today, Tessa Weirach, and I'd ask, like to ask her to stand up and uh, make sure everybody can see who you are so that they can, uh, they can contact you. We will have our first meeting sometime next week. We don't have a date or a time set yet. I will announce it next week in class so you will all know. So obviously it won't be Monday next week. Yes, um, right. And it is the, it's the Repair the World. Coalition. Repair the World. It's okay. 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 Excuse me. <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, so please contact uh, Tessa so that you can be uh, on the list for those who get information about when that meeting is going to be. So I have two final points that I would like to make, um, and that is number one. Um, professors are used to 50-minute lectures. I see I've gone about 45 here right now. Um, and uh, that would allow us for 10 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, but I'm not sure about physicians. Okay, I don't know if they're in the 50-minute mold or not. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to ask you is please be patient if some of these lecturers go over a bit. Um, and it may turn out that the question period which comes after their lecture is the most important learning experience for you. So try to stay for that as well. I know it's a little bit late, but uh, I think that you'll be happy that you did that. So. Uh, I'll try to tell them to keep it to 50 minutes, but uh, you know, I'm just a little bit nervous because I don't know if that fits in terms of their culture or not. Um, and the second thing I want to say, and this is my concluding comment for tonight, and then I'll be happy to take any questions you might have, is please don't be shy about showing your appreciation and admiration for the Montanans who are going to be taking time from their very busy professional uh, schedules and lives to share their experiences with you. And if it's not immediately apparent, I'll just come right out and say it, without any compensation. We aren't able to offer them any kind of an honorarium or anything for coming and spending their time talking with you. Um, so in one case, as I've already mentioned, a person is going to drive here all the way from Livingston to be uh, able to share with you her insights. Um, so the, what I would say, and I'm not referring to tonight, but starting next Monday, a rousing round of applause at the end of each lecture would not be out of place. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so are there any questions for tonight? All right. So, and by the way, one last thing is, um, if you think this is exciting, if you think it looks good, if you're really excited about it, go tell some of your friends. I still take people in as far as next week is concerned because we really haven't heard anything substantial yet. That starts next week. So let your friends know about this class too. Thank you.